j'ai entendu parler d'un monde où l'on vivait dans l'ombre, à l'abri, constamment caché. Un monde où l'on cherche à se mettre à l'abri du soleil, ce même soleil sans lequel la vie sur Terre ne serait pas possible. Un monde où l'on doit sans cesse protéger notre peau, nos yeux, où les cancers de la peau se multiplient, les systèmes immunitaires s'affaiblissent, la vie marine périt peu à peu, les animaux disparaissent, les plantes et les cultures se détériorent. Heureusement, notre terre possède un bouclier naturel qui nous protège d'un tel scénario. Ce bouclier, c'est la couche d'ozone. Elle s'étend au-dessus du globe terrestre, haut dans l'atmosphère. Elle filtre les rayons ultraviolets provenant du soleil. Un numéro d'équilibriste délicat. Au milieu des années 70, des chercheurs ont découvert que nos réfrigérateurs, nos climatiseurs, nos bombes au sol, nos équipements de lutte anti-incendie, ainsi que certains solvants et pesticides, endommageaient la couche d'ozone. Peu de temps après, l'ampleur des dégâts fut révélée. Cela se passait juste au-dessus de l'Antarctique, une découverte qui allait faire suite à une action mondiale sans précédent pour la protection de notre environnement. C'était il y a plus de 25 ans. Mais comment un tel trou peut-il apparaître ainsi dans l'atmosphère J'ai décidé d'en savoir plus. Ma quête de réponse me conduira auprès de scientifiques en pointe sur le sujet, ceux qui ont découvert le trou de la couche d'ozone et ceux qui l'étudient depuis. Première étape, Cambridge au Royaume-Uni, où le British Antarctic Survey surveille les niveaux d'ozone depuis les années 50. Jonathan Shanklin fut le premier à constater que quelque chose n'allait pas. When we made our discovery, ozone had then been monitored from the Antarctic for nearly 30 years, that we had a whole stack of handwritten sheets where the basic numbers from the instrument had been written down, but they hadn't been processed to give the ozone amount. And so as a young graduate, I was given the task of supervising all this and coming up with the, the answers. What I did was plot out the, the lowest 11-day running mean value each Antarctic spring. Ozone levels seemed to be falling off the charts. And at that point, the other members of the team, Joe Farman and Brian Gardner, came up with a paper that was published in Nature and showed something really strange was going on over Antarctica. Les mesures effectuées au sol chaque année au printemps prouvaient en effet que les taux d'ozone diminuaient de façon abyssale au-dessus de l'Antarctique. Mon enquête me mène ensuite à la NASA, au centre des vols spatiaux Goddard, où j'apprends que cette évolution inquiétante avait été confirmée par des observations faites depuis l'espace. It was shortly after that that the first pictures of the Antarctic ozone hole came out from the satellite data. Remember that uh, a ground station just looks up and sees one spot on the Earth. But the satellite gives you a global picture of total ozone, and that's where the name ozone hole comes from. It looked like a, a hole had been punched through the ozone layer. In retrospect, that was a really good thing to call it, because an ozone hole must be bad. Almost automatically, it meant that people wanted something doing about it. The hole had to be filled in. L'ozone dispose d'un processus naturel de régulation, mais cet équilibre a été fortement perturbé par l'utilisation de certaines substances chimiques, notamment les chlorofluorocarbones et les halons. Chlorofluorocarbon is a is very non-reactive gas. It, you can breathe it um, and it doesn't affect you at all. But when you release this gas, it gets fairly well mixed in the lower atmosphere and then it leaks into the stratosphere. And these chlorofluorocarbons get above the ozone layer, actually. So they get broken down by that intense solar radiation that's sort of beyond the ozone layer. Now, once they do that, they free a chlorine atom. And the chlorine atom engages in a little catalytic reaction. It will react with ozone, and then it will react with another oxygen atom to regenerate itself back to chlorine. So one chlorine molecule, a little cycle, Can destroy thousands of ozone molecules. Si les substances chimiques détruisant la couche d'ozone étaient émises dans le monde entier, pourquoi la destruction de cette couche avait-elle lieu juste au-dessus de l'Antarctique? During winter, the stratosphere in the polar region is very cold. 
And so temperature can reach about minus 80 degrees. And in these conditions, clouds are formed. They are called the polar stratospheric clouds. And on the surface of these clouds, there are chemical reactions that convert chlorine compounds to very efficient compounds. So the air cools. As it cools, it sinks. And as it sinks, it begins to spin. And this sets up what's called the polar vortex, stopping exchange with the outside and turning the center of Antarctica into a giant cooking pot where all the chemistry takes place that destroys the ozone. We certainly thought that the discovery would shake a, a, a lot of groups up. It's being called an unprecedented display of international cooperation to protect the world's environment. The Montreal Protocol signed today aims at stopping the deterioration of the ozone layer in the atmosphere. The Montreal Protocol was really a, a landmark agreement and it really required um, a scientific foundation, that is, you had to have solid science that formed the basis of the Montreal Protocol. And then that fed upward to um, policymakers, government policymakers, politicians, um, industry people, technologists. Um, how, if you got rid of chlorofluorocarbons, how did you substitute for those chlorofluorocarbons? All those groups came together, and in 1987, um, they negotiated the Montreal Protocol. It's quite amazing that every single one of the UN member states has signed up to the treaty and it's working. By the uh, mid-1990s, the production in developed countries of these ozone-depleting uh, substances had been largely stopped. And now, even in developing countries, chlorofluorocarbons are no longer produced. Pour les remplacer, des substituts de transition ont donc été créés. Ils sont réexaminés périodiquement en fonction des évaluations scientifiques et technologiques. De nombreux groupes d'études à travers le monde observent le succès du protocole. Parmi eux, l'administration américaine océanique et atmosphérique dans la ville de Boulder, au Colorado. You can very clearly see in the measurements that the actions of the Montreal Protocol have reduced the emissions of ODSs and also you can actually see the change in the concentration of ODSs in the lower atmosphere as well as in the stratosphere. The ozone layer now has stabilized. It doesn't uh, decrease anymore, but we are still waiting for the abundance of ozone to increase to previous uh, level. So we still have to enforce the Montreal Protocol, uh, mainly because of uh, the very large lifetime of these gases. We did a study here in which we looked at um, what would have happened if, if chlorofluorocarbons just kept increasing steadily with time. So, as we went from 1960 into the future, chlorine was going up and up and up. Now, what if chlorine wasn't regulated? That the Montreal Protocol did not occur, chlorine would have kept going up, and ozone would have kept heading down and down and down. And so by the time you got out here to 2065, two-thirds of the ozone layer is gone. Now, what that means is it means a couple of things. First of all, because you have no ozone above you, you have lots of the solar ultraviolet radiation that can penetrate to the Earth's surface. You get sunburned very fast and very severe sunburns in some cases. Skin cancer cases would go up. Cataracts, eye cataracts would increase. And as crops failed, crop prices would increase. This would probably lead to political instability. There would have been many, many unfortunate effects of large ozone depletion. And so the Montreal Protocol has had a dramatic effect on saving us from that world. We think that the chlorofluorocarbons would be decreased to sufficiently low level that the ozone hole would be disappearing towards the end of this century. We need to take care of our atmosphere and the Montreal Protocol shows us the way to go. This is something that is working, and equally amazingly, 
the Montreal Protocol has done a huge amount to combat, combat climate change. Ozone depleting substances like chlorofluorocarbons are also powerful greenhouse gases. So what that means is that when we regulated chlorofluorocarbons, ozone depleting substances, you get a dual benefit. You benefited not only the ozone layer, but you benefited climate. We're now going to add into the atmosphere, we're going to use as replacements, gases that have as much climate change or more than the CFCs. They're called hydrofluorocarbons. And so if you wanted to um, uh, do some action on climate change through the Montreal Protocol, you could consider uh, the replacement with new technologies or less climate active gases um, rather than the, the gases we're currently looking at. Une augmentation de nos émissions de gaz à effet de serre a réchauffé la surface de la planète ainsi que la basse couche de l'atmosphère. Des changements de température, des circulations des vents ainsi que des produits chimiques découverts dans l'atmosphère affecteront la couche d'ozone de multiples façons qui demeurent encore difficiles à prévoir. Climate is going to change the stratosphere and change ozone levels because of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So these are not ozone-depleting substances that are regulated under the Montreal Protocol. Initially, one of our worries about um, the ozone hole was that climate change, the increased amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, warming the surface of the planet, but cooling the ozone layer. So it has an influence uh, on the formation of polar stratospheric clouds, and this will delay ozone recovery in that region. More recently, we found that the ozone hole itself is interacting with the climate. We are now recognizing that, in fact, changes in the stratosphere, changes of ozone, can have an effect on surface climate, something that wasn't really well recognized uh, 10, 20 years ago. When people started worrying about ozone depletion, they were concerned about things like skin cancer primarily and ultraviolet rays. And um, in the last uh, several years, you know, it became clear that you know, the ozone depletion impacts very strongly uh, the circulation, the winds, you know, the flow in the atmosphere. This is the Earth, it's the equator, the North Pole, this is the South Pole. If you have an ozone hole and the ozone isn't there anymore, then locally you have a cooling now because you're not absorbing the rays and so you're colder than you would be if the ozone were there. And as a consequence of, of that cooling, the winds react. And a very simple and manifest way in which they react is that the storm tracks have been moving forward. And together with that, the precipitation and the desertic region are all moving towards the pole. Ozone recovering will, will be a, a major component of climate changes in the coming decades and it has to be accounted for. And it seems to me that, therefore, any discussion having to do with um, greenhouse gases cannot be had without, at the same time, discussing um, ozone recovery. Because we now know of these feedbacks between the ozone hole and climate, and climate and the ozone hole, the provisions of the Montreal Protocol do allow regulation of any gases that may affect the ozone layer. And because there is such widespread agreement that the protocol is a good treaty that is working and that all countries can um, sign up for, maybe that is the way that we can go in the future. Montreal Protocol started off with what I would call baby steps. They took a decision and based on science, they changed the decision a few years later, again a few years later, so there are a lot of amendments and adjustments which finally became so successful. There may be a lesson in that for the climate negotiations and climate decisions also. The Montreal Protocol, I believe this, and it's a, this is an opinion, um, is a great, it's a great example of what can be accomplished if nations, industry, technologists and scientists all combine to work on a problem. I, I think it would be um, incorrect to say that because the ozone hole is closing, the ozone story is finished. We have half a century or more to see what, what is going to happen, you know, as a consequence of the Montreal Protocol, in fact. And we expect things to be both interesting scientifically, but also practically um, uh, challenging, you know. So we'll see what happens. 
Il semblerait donc que, grâce au protocole de Montréal, le trou de la couche d'ozone se résorbe. Cependant, notre atmosphère change en permanence. Il est donc difficile d'établir des prévisions précises quant à son évolution. Mais en fin de compte, j'ai appris que le rôle que nous jouons est considérable. Parce que si nous sommes peut-être capables de détruire notre atmosphère, nous pouvons aussi travailler ensemble à l'échelle mondiale et réparer les dommages que nous avons infligés à la planète afin de la protéger pour les générations à venir. »